Hi, my name's Steve Allgaier, the Hort Man, and we're here today, late spring, early summer, whatever you want to call it. Today feels spring-like, yesterday it was hot. Um, and we're going to cover a couple different topics today. Um, first, I'd like to start with lawn care. Um, many Carroll Countyans take great pride in their lawn, and it can be a source of frustration. Uh, my job, just to back up a little bit, I work with the University of Maryland Extension, and I'm here in Carroll County, and if you're familiar with the Ag Center Complex, we're the very first building, or I'm located in the very first building at the end of Smith Avenue. Um, my job is kind of to help you, Carroll County citizens, with issues that you're having in your lawn and your landscape, and I get lots of questions about lawns. Um, this time of the year, surprisingly, is what I call the bitter end of the lawn season. Now, obviously, there's a lot of maintenance to be done, especially cutting the grass, but there's not a whole lot that you can really do to improve your lawn other than making sure it's um, is, is cut correctly and at the right height. And the question I invariably get this time of the year is people start dragging in their lawn weeds, and they want to know how to get rid of it or get rid of these various weeds. And really, the, the key to keeping lawn weeds out is keeping your lawn healthy and thick. Many people think that the weeds come in and they push out the turf, when in fact, it's actually the turf has gotten thin and the weeds have moved into their lawns. Um, ideally, if you cut your lawns at three to three and a half inches tall and you cut them frequently, or you cut it frequently while, while it's growing, you tend to create dense turf. The other thing is, if you want to have a thick, weed-free lawn, you almost have to feed the lawn, and that's best done in the fall um, twice, usually in September and then in November, using a, a prescribed lawn fertilizer. Um, the, the fertilizer laws have changed a little bit for homeowners, so now you can't fertilize past November 15th if you're a homeowner. And the other big thing that's changed for homeowners is phosphorus has been taken out of maintenance fertilizers for turf grass. Now, ideally, you should be planning for taking care of your lawn weeds in the fall or late summer as it starts to cool off. Many of the, um, the, the lawn care products that will get rid of weeds aren't as efficient or as effective during the warm season because, like grass, weeds will slow down. But a lot of these products work best when the lawn is actively growing and when the weeds are actively growing. So you should make plans and maybe start to identify where your, your weed issues are. For many people, I tell them a weed-free lawn is very tough to maintain and achieve. And ideally, maybe you should establish a threshold of what you feel comfortable with. So at this point in the game, um, the best thing you can do for your lawn is make sure that you're cutting it frequently. And that the frequency is measured by cutting off no more than one-third the height of the plant. Anything more, like you go on vacation for two weeks and your grass shoots up to five or six inches and you cut it back to three inches, you're removing half of that height. That's hard on the plant. You're removing a lot of its mass. So if you can reduce the, the, the proportion that's cut off with each mowing, it's going to be easier and healthier for your, your turf grass. You'll end up getting a thicker grass and thicker lawn that will prevent, prevent weeds from creeping in. Um, we have what we call the catch of the day or catch of the week. Um, this week, I have two things that are um, starting to come into my office quite often. One is this vining weed, and as you can see, it kind of has a, a heart-shaped leaf with a point on it. And as you look down the stem of this, this weed, you'll also find, or this vining weed, you'll find these um, what are called lenticel scars or lenticels. And these are actually white spots on this vine, which kind of is a, a, a telltale sign of what it is. It's, a, uh, it's called Oriental Climbing Bittersweet. Um, it was brought over years ago and is starting to take over our woodlands. You typically find it on the edge of woods um, in great abundance because there's lots of sunshine and there's lots of stuff for this stuff to crawl on. Um, there is a native bittersweet, but I rarely see it. Um, this is the stuff that will produce bright kind of reddish orange berries in the fall and in the winter. Um, but really, it should be roped out of your woodlands because the biggest detriment we find is that as this thing gets bigger, it starts to crawl up into the canopy of the tree, and this will outcompete the tree's leaves for sunlight and eventually cause that tree to diminish or decline. 
Um, not the easiest weed to control. You think, boy, how can I do this organically? Well, you could keep cutting it or, or um, trying to pull it up, but many times the vine will get a very large trunk on it. And ideally what you can do is some mechanical control, meaning cutting it out. Um, but you probably need to follow up by treating that stump with an herbicide that's prescribed for this. And I kind of mentioned herbicides back in the, um, the lawn care uh, portion that we, we were talking about earlier. Herbicides um, are all very different and your controls probably, you, you need to make a good match with your, with your weed to the herbicide. And what I tell people is, make sure you read and understand your herbicide label. It's a bit daunting because typically you look at the back of the bottle or the front of the bottle and they have some pretty green colors and it'll say kills all sorts of lawn weeds. But then as you open up the back, you'll discover that it's multiple pages of instructions. Um, but please read these instructions. By law, you aren't supposed to use a lawn weed killer or weed killer on a weed that isn't listed on the label. So make sure you follow directions um, when, you, when you mix and when you use these products. On the other end of catch of the day are some of the wildflowers that are blooming. Unfortunately, this one has not come into bloom and it's kind of gotten a little limp, but it's a, it's a compound leaf shrub that you see a lot in wetlands. And a lot of people um, have heard and few people have tried elderberries. This flower head, which is just about to open up, will produce a whole bundle of white flowers and kind of a flat, they call it quorum, it looks like an umbrella of uh, blooms. And those blooms will eventually develop into small, very dark, almost black seeds. Um, these seeds are great tasting, but you have to beat the birds to it. You'll see this grow about four to eight foot tall, um, anywhere in between. And a lot of times you'll find this growing in wetlands. There are now cultivated varieties for home gardeners and the beauty of something like this is that um, you can get some that actually have better habit, meaning they're a little bit shorter. And there's a new ornamental variety that has purple leaves, um, very dark purple leaves, and that's quite attractive in a home landscape. Um, actually, this is a little bit out of the landscape, but it, it's made it into my um, office quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, are these small black bugs that people find on their windowsills. And they, they're finding them primarily on kitchen window sills. And right away when I see these, I, I know what they are, or at least what group of, of bugs they're from. And these are our notorious pantry pests. And these are pests that actually infest food. And what will happen is many of them come in in products that are grain related. Um, they have all sorts of great names like drugstore beetle and cigarette beetle, hide beetles, varied carpet beetles but invariably they're all very small and typically when they discover a food source, their populations can explode to the point where you see lots of them littering windowsills. Um, unfortunately, there's not a magic bullet. There's not a, um, a spray that you could put out there that would get rid of these things very easily. And if you think about it, something that's contaminating food, you probably don't want to spray anyway. Um, so what I tell people is your job, and it's easy for me to say, is to get in into your pantry or into your cupboards where you're storing any of these things like flour, pasta, even spices they'll get into, nut meats, and start looking in containers and seeing what's infested. Um, the biggie that I find quite a bit is people with cake flour that's been sitting for a long time. They'll pull the box out and there'll be all these little caterpillars. These beetles start out as small kind of grub like caterpillars and that's the, the consuming life stage of it. Um, and basically what you do is you try and isolate their food source, get rid of that food source, and then ideally seal off those other things they can get into, which means getting some type of container like Tupperware that seals tightly to keep these things out because what you're going to do is starve the population by removing the food source. Um, just a couple hints, if you do have these things, things like cat food and dog food have lots of grain, so check those containers if you have those dried cat food and dog food containers. The other thing is some of these things will make a living off of dried flower arrangements. And you look at a dried flower arrangements, a lot of times there will be seed heads in there, wheat or whatever, and they can feed on that. Um, let's see. Uh, if you want to focus down here, um, 
we have a great sample that just came in today. It's probably the largest um, fishing spider that I've seen. This is a spider that you find throughout Maryland. I get about three or four a year. My guess is this is a pregnant female. She probably hasn't laid her eggs, hence her size. Um, but these are slow, or I mean a large, fast-moving spider. They're predatory. They tend to chase down their food, um, crickets, large bugs. I see it'll need salamanders. And evidently they can, uh, hence the name, they can eat um, uh, some small fish. Uh, generally, they aren't a problem for people, but you will find these things near houses, especially if you have woods and maybe streams or a water feature because they like to hang out in moisture. And we think woods can be dry, but many times there's hollow trees that have cavities and moisture accumulates. You'll see these things every so often. You have to look because they're quick. And um, they always startle me when I take them out of the jar to move them to another jar, how fast they'll run across the floor. So, but generally they're considered beneficial because they will help to control other insects. Um, in the crystal ball, what's coming up, um, it should be an interesting year. If you're a gardener, they hate to hear this word, but um, Japanese beetle population should be up. Um, the last couple years, their populations have been growing. And in general, what we found is that Japanese beetles, um, their highest mortality rate tends to be when they're young and they've hatched out of their eggs, which typically are underground. During dry summers, say end of July going into August, even into September, those eggs that are hatching out, if the soil's dry, the mortality rate of Japanese beetles is very high, so you're going to have fewer of them. But the last couple summers, we've had relatively good ground moisture because of rain through August and September. And Japanese beetles look like they should take off. So if you're a rose lover or if you have lindens, um, which are a large ornamental tree, um, you may find a fair amount of foliage damage. The biggest curse, though, tends to be for, um, for, for people who really care for their lawns because Japanese beetles love to lay their eggs in an area where there'll be roots for their young to feed on, and turf is great. Um, a quick hint is if you do choose to put down a grub control product, make sure, again, you read the label and understand what it does. There's several new good products out there that have long-lasting effect, and most of them, them will tell you to put the uh, grub control product down in July into August. Um, ideally, it should be in July and these should give you good protection, at least for your turf grass. Um, let's see, lastly, we will move on to, oh no, we've got one other thing here. Um, we had a dry spell, it ended about two, two and a half weeks ago, and with the end of the dry spell means rain, and lots of people have been coming in with ants. Um, ants are tough to recognize, or they're worried that they're termites, and you get lots of these things I don't think we'll let any of these guys go. You get lots of these things that make a wrong turn and end up in the house. Um, the easy thing, and I don't know if this is a good background or not, but ants, <laughs> the breeze may blow them away. Um, an easy way to figure out if you have ants or termites is to look at first the body shape. With ants, they have very distinct body segments. The abdomen and the head and the thorax are easy to see. And if you look at, this is a bit bulky. If you look at this body, you can see that there is a distinct abdomen, then distinct um, head and thorax region. The other easy way of t differentiating an ant between a termite is termite wings are typically twice the length of the body, if not longer than that. These wings only extend maybe just the length of the body. Um, and if you're really nerdy about this, you can get some of these um, uh, you can get a, a strong magnifying glass and look at the antenna. Um, ants always have what we call elbowed antennas, where it's like the arm that forms a 90 degree or something close to 90 degrees, whereas termite antenna look like a string of beads, and they, they curl slightly, so it's a, a very um, distinct difference in, in those three areas of differentiating between the, uh, the critters. Of course, ants tend to be less of a worry. Um, Every species of ant has, uh, produces um, these reproductive flyers. Their only mission in life is to mate and lay eggs. And I've seen lots of these. They tend to be triggered by 
um, adequate moisture, and they think a lot, both ants and termites will produce their reproductives based on barometric pressure because as the barometer starts to drop, that typically is a good indicator of rain coming up, which would aid in the survival of these kind of clumsy flyers. If you've ever seen termites or ants flying around your house, they tend to not fly in a very straight line and get blown all over the place because they lack flying skills. Um, in the vegetable garden, and a lot of people love vegetable gardens, we have um, all sorts of problems coming in with adequate rain and cooling temperatures that we had for a while. We get diseases. Um, we were blessed a little bit. Um, a lot of the early diseases that I typically see, I didn't see as much of because we had that early dry spell through the spring, which worried me because, of course, in the spring you need moisture for plants to grow. But um, the first couple uh, tomatoes came in, uh, or potatoes, I'm sorry, they're in the same family, and they're starting to get these blackened stems. And this is a type of, uh, of, of black leg rot, they call it. And it's usually a, a bacteria that comes in on the tuber and causes this rot. And you'll see the tomatoes fall over, um, with, or, or potatoes fall over. So with both potatoes and tomatoes, you kind of have to watch diseases. Um, I wish you luck this year. Hopefully it won't get too cold or cool through the summer and moist because the potatoes will tend to develop more of these fungal and bacterial issues. Um, also, I have coming up, if you're interested, I also help to coordinate the Master Gardener program. If you don't know what it is, on June 25th in the evening, I have a, um, I have a training coming up, and it's about how to become a Master Gardener and what Master Gardeners are involved in, what, what it means to be a Master Gardener. And that will be in the evening, starting at 6.30. It's just a two-hour program. We'll tell you a little bit about the University of Maryland and Extension. And Extension, I haven't really explained earlier, but Extension is a, we a weird creature. It's this, um, it's, it's a, a, an outreach that's done nationally throughout the U.S. And, and it effectively, it, was, it came about around the Civil War, and it was a means of getting university information out to the citizens. And in, that point in time, it was really the farmer, hence we have 4-H and we do a lot of farm outreach, but it's changed over time and the Master Gardener program is outreach for really the non-agricultural person. It's for somebody who's interested in general gardening and landscape and is interested in giving back to the community because Master Gardener's role is really to help me educate the public. Um, if you have questions or you need to contact me, I'm a resource for you for the residents of Carroll County, feel free to contact me at the email below. Um, that's hortman at umd.edu or at the phone number listed below. To, sub to subscribe to us, click below. To like us on social media, click above. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.